I'm with the legendary Wesley Clark, a man who actually been a great Secretary of Defense. But Mr. Clark, what do you think of the inauguration today? And also Chuck Hagel, I might add. So, yeah. Oh, Chuck Hagel's a great guy. Yeah. Um, he was a real he was a real friend of mine when I was in the military, and he supported me. He was a senator, senator on the Senate Armed Services Committee. No, I think he's terrific. He'll do a great job, Secretary of Defense. We're we looking forward to with the inauguration of the president today. Well, I, you know, I hope he lays out the themes for this second administration. I think he's got a real challenge. It's it's not just a matter of, of working with people on the Hill. And I think that some of the commentators really haven't clarified this to the American people. For 30 years, some people in this country have built an alternate reality. Right. That's all you can describe it as. It started with a different vision of economics. It has a different view of what America is and a different interpretation of our history. Uh, it's like a parallel universe. That's a great point. It's done and a lot of damage. It's done a lot you know? of damage. And, uh, it doesn't represent the, the world experience of the majority of Americans. I think if there hadn't been such uh, strong efforts to retard voting in this election, uh, the president would have won by double the majority or more that he won by. I, I was out on the ground in Ohio and Virginia. I talked to people. I got a feel for uh, what was happening at the grassroots level. And I just think that uh, uh, the, the alternate reality just uh, it doesn't represent the majority of Americans. So his second administration challenge is not just to uh, be a good leader in Washington and work with Congress. He's got to lead the American people and he's got to bring these two visions closer together. We've got to not, it's not just about saying we're one America, not blue, not red. It's about actually taking apart the competing visions and creating a synthesis, if necessary, to pull this country back together. Who are we? What do we stand for? And how do we move forward together? And this is it's a very tough that. challenge because because, um, you know, he's, he is, uh, uh, he's a terrific leader, our president, but he's also a symbol of, of what some people don't like. And that's, he's, uh, makes it a, this is a really, cha real deep challenge for this country. I get the sense, though, that we're turning around toward that ideal vision uh, over time. Just, to, just, I mean, I, I, your thoughts, you know? I think that, um, you, you'd think that, what, what happened was that in the 1970s, uh, politics became uh, more of a moral issue on the right and less of a collaborative right. issue. Maybe it was a moral issue on the left in the early years of the 20th century. I don't know, I wasn't around then. But maybe when it came to things like women's voting and things like this, maybe this was a moral issue, you know, people felt really strongly about it. But somehow, when we came out of Vietnam, we came out of the sexual revolution, the civil rights movement, everything, there were a lot of people in this country that didn't get it. And this became sort of, uh, they, they set up, they they became the counterculture, yeah. in essence. And they were subsidized by a lot of people who could make money off of it if they could roll back the social safety net that was put in place by the Democratic leadership over these years. And it's been 35 years of, of misinformation out there. It's a very deep problem. And I don't know if it's turning around or not because the issue really has to do with getting jobs for middle class right, Americans right. and raising wages. That. Absolutely. I was talking to a, um, a man who's a former high ranking official of the Indian government and he said, oh, he said, you're, you're having trouble in America. I said, yeah. He says, he says, you'll make it. Just when you're, when India's wages reach yours, you'll have plenty of employment in America. He the national that. division of labor, the big yeah. problem. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, labor's lost its bargaining power, right. but also it's not just the international, it's also with some help from the federal government. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've allowed big corporations to attack labor unions and take a tax write off for it. Um, and we haven't enforced antitrust legislation. We right. haven't really made the Small Business Administration work the way it should. Small businessmen out there cannot get the kind of loans. Startups aren't working. Capital markets aren't working. Um, it's it's the influence of 30 years of 
policy that's converging to change the shape of America uh, right in front of our eyes, and it has to be uh, it has to be stopped or reversed. And let me mention some of these. Sure, sure. We lost the fairness in media. Right. You know, we lost the idea that. Uh, uh, you couldn't control all of the telecommunications across the country, so we let uh, we let these cable companies and, and television networks roll up stations. We let people have monopoly stations in most towns in America. One radio corporation controls the entire news divisions. I went out to do a charity uh, broadcast in Little Rock several years ago and went out to this, this is a great na radio network. He said, oh yeah, we got all the stations here. I said, how many stations do you have here? He said, oh, we got eight of them. God, this is all right here. He said, yeah, but we all use the same newsroom. I said, oh, that's really good. Yeah, everybody gets the same news. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Owned by one corporation. Sounds like you have another book in here. Well, I'd like to... I, I, I'm not or another sure presidential run? that it's another book. I, it, and I, it's not about politics. It's really about... I've had a lot of life experiences. I'd love to be able to share those life experiences in a constructive way and help the country see it without having a vested interest in anything, but just to see what's happened. When you allow media consolidation, banking consolidation, industrial consolidation, and unlimited influence of money, or virtually unlimited, through citizens united, you're setting the stage for the collapse of the American middle class as we know it. Do you think social media offers a counter, though, to the social media consolidation is going to uh, Social media is going to be subjected to the same pressures. That is true. So it won't be long yeah. before you're going to find it's it. Well said. It's yeah. pushed yeah, right. to the outside. It's happening. And you're right. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, you know, yes, you'd like to say social media would do it. Sure. So U.S. Postal Service would could help too. Mm -hmm. But of course, that's under attack also. <laughs> and so the the all of these the idea that. That, that people should pay for exactly the service they use. It sounds like a common sense idea. It's like, sure. hey, I don't have any kids in school. Why should I pay for schooling? Yeah. Um, but I'm not driving, so... No, but I do drive, so then why should I care about public transportation? But then, you know... They, and they take this idea, boom, 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 and every one of them sounds logical. When I was a student at Oxford, I remember the reading about the transportation economic studies being done in England. It was like, oh, make these people on these motorways pay a toll because that way, you know, otherwise, as soon as you build a new motorway, it's filled with traffic. Now, yes, well, maybe that means that people need it. We always taught that in planning school in Berkeley. That's what it's school. absolutely yeah. wrong. Right. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's absolutely wrong. I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. And but until people see this, what sounds like a common sense idea isn't a common sense idea. If you build a motorway or an expressway and it's immediately filled, then what it should tell you is build another one. That's right. Yeah. You need yeah. more public, more transportation. That's what people want. And individuals can't build expressways. When you charge people tolls like that, you're discriminating against right. the very Absolutely. people who need these services. Yeah. American civilization worked because there was an unlimited frontier. And we built this country because from the very start, from the beginning at Jamestown, people could, if they didn't like it the way it was, they could move. And out there, there was land, there was freedom, there was opportunity, and you know, you were as good as your effort. When you structure and build a tight system in which money's inherited, um, certain institutions, uh, education means a lot more from than other institutions, and you have a tracking system that starts almost from the time you're born, people get locked in. That's not the America of the American dream. I know there's a lot of people who still come to this country from abroad, and there's always wonderful success stories. That's great. That's true. But actually, Today, America has less upward mobility yeah. than has. any of its other economic competitors in the Organization of Economic Cooperation Development. We're more stratified, the distribution of income is more unequal, and not to mention the distribution of wealth. So this is a country which is rapidly losing its character and becoming something else. So austerity policy is bad, though. Very bad. Yeah, it's bad. not about debt. There's no real issue with debt right, right. in the United States. Well, this said. is I agree. this I agree. is all yeah. about getting people to 
to uh, use uh, the language of family and individuals. It's, a, it's called a fallacy of composition mm -hmm. yeah. in that the thing that works for an individual doesn't work for a country. We print our own money. Right. There's no issue with people borrowing for the, with, with the U.S. government borrowing. I mean, nobody's charging the government. We're paying the government to take our money. Yeah. Yeah. So well, there's no problem with, with, with debt. Now, will there be a problem with debt? Maybe. I, d I doubt it. I think the real problem here is that people don't have jobs. And the jobs they have, they don't pay enough for it. And, um, and we need to fix that in this country. We need to raise this minimum wage. I've heard all the economic arguments about, hey, you'll f push people out of jobs. It's wrong. If people want to work and sell in this country and live in this country, they ought to pay. Furthermore, we ought to stop the business community from being able to exploit state governments and then leave and pick up and put jobs overseas. I, I support what the president says. There are countries, uh, companies outsourcing and they want to move to Mexico. They can move to Mexico, but they should not get tax deductions for the loss on their property and the business that they invested here. That doesn't count. And, by the way, they ought to be paying wages to the workers so they've got a chance to get another job and they ought to pay back the incentives to the states. You sound like a presidential candidate again. You should consider it, I say. I, I, it's just not about politics. I know, it, I know. I'm because saying, yeah. once you uh, you go into the political thing, people don't take you seriously. I learned that the last time. Really? You don't think that... Hmm. No, I don't. When you're running for office, That's the whole idea is say as little as possible. If you really believe and you want to teach, you have to say as much as possible. So it's actually diametrically the opposite. Everybody understands, nobody better than Mitt Romney, that <laughs> you're not supposed to say yeah. everything that you believe. Right. right? If you want to teach and you want to help, you have to. And then you, you people take shots at you. So it's just a question of how you want to, how, how you want to play a role. And um, I had my shot at public office. I loved it. It would have been a wonderful experience, and I'm grateful for the wonderful support I got from people. It gave me a chance to see America in many different dimensions than I had in uniform. But having seen it, then, I, said, I love this country. I don't want to see it go the wrong direction. And somehow you have to have to preserve that equality of opportunity that's made this country what it is. You have to keep it turning over. You can't have dynasties. You don't have royalty in America. There have always been a few families who've made it, but mostly they don't. And you want a system that lets each generation start mostly afresh and have the same life experiences and challenges and opportunities for growth. You want to let talent and determination and energy and ambition rise to the top in the right way. You don't want to have a generation of people who are at the top who believe that it's their due because of their birthright. That's not what America was about. It, there's always been a human nature to want to make it like that. We always had a frontier. You know, we always had a different way. If you didn't like it in Virginia, you went to West Virginia. You went west. You went to Ohio. If you didn't like Ohio, you went to California. Someplace else. I mean, and and it turns out that you know, human potential is unlimited. There's talent everywhere. Just give people an opportunity and let them grow. But in so many cases, and even I saw it in my own state of Arkansas when I went back there after military service, the opportunities aren't there for everybody. So, and it's not its not because of um, the law, it's just the way human nature is. So, you've got to keep it turning over, and you've got to be very careful with the law not to allow um, the uh, structure to be frozen in place. So, if money talks, you've got to have ways for other people who don't have the money to talk. You've got to build an inclusive society, not an exclusive society. Something happened while you were talking. The sun came out and it got warm. That's a great way to end. Thank you. <laughs>